it would be irresponsible to take, uh, you know, to right away just cut into budget without having any ideas on how to reallocate that money. Tonight, Montreal increases its police budget while a coalition proposes an alternative. And for policing Indigenous protests in particular, it was really kind of sensationalizing the threat. A former RCMP intelligence analyst is found to be the moderator of a private Facebook group containing racist comments. There was no kind of role models, there was nobody that I had access to that could support me. And a new group emerges out of Alberta to help artists. Good evening, I'm Melissa Ridge and welcome to APTN National News. We begin tonight in Ottawa where Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller gave a press conference to elaborate on the $1.5 billion commitment by the federal government in Monday's fiscal update. That was to end all long-term drinking water advisories in First Nations. Out of that $1.5 billion, Miller said $600 million would go to early detection to avoid problems in water systems. 500 million will go to build infrastructure and 300 million to respond to project delays like the COVID-19 pandemic. Miller said this is a response to communities not wanting deadlines but rather lasting solutions. What we're saying to communities today is we're there for the long term. Uh, this isn't a deadline where we'll just walk away and somehow um, our consciences are clear. Uh, quite the opposite. This is a, a much deeper commitment to walking along uh, the path of ensuring that communities have safe access to clean and reliable drinking water for the long term. Recent comments made by Manitoba's Premier have some First Nations groups accusing the leader of fear-mongering during the COVID-19 pandemic. Brittany Hobson explains. Manitoba Premier Brian Pallister is demanding clarity from the federal government when it comes to the rollout of a COVID-19 vaccine. During a press conference, Pallister suggested people may descend on First Nations if they are part of the initial rollout. Half our Indigenous people don't live on reserve, but if a vaccine is made available on Northern Reserves before it's available in Southern Manitoba, we're going to have a, an outpouring, a, a migration of folks naturally who want to get vaccinated up to Northern communities, maybe taking COVID with them. Pallister's comments are not sitting well with First Nations groups in the province. Southern Chiefs Organization Grand Chief Jerry Daniels says a premier is resorting to fear-mongering. He's making it uh, sound like as if uh, First Nations are uh, presenting an illegitimate case and, and, and trying to take away from some of the other vulnerable sectors of our society. Obviously, we care about our elders, whether they're Indigenous or non-Indigenous. We care about all of our elder people. We care about all of our vulnerable people. Uh, we're just trying to emphasize, and that's our job, to emphasize the fact that uh, First Nations are also very vulnerable. As of December 1st, First Nations people accounted for 25% of the current hospitalizations and 39% of ICU patients in Manitoba due to COVID-19. The Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs is also taking issue with Pallister's views. In a statement, Grand Chief Arlen Dumas said there is no indication vaccines will be distributed to the North first. It will still be months before a COVID-19 vaccine rolls out across Canada. And while distribution will fall on provinces and territories, the federal government says frontline workers and marginalized groups will likely be the first groups to get them. I think it'll guide our policy as we roll out the vaccine to priority groups, um, not only in areas where we talk about reserves, uh, where there is a huge federal role, but as we talk about um, some of the work that needs to be done in urban areas. Brittany Hobson, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Nunavut added 11 new COVID-19 cases today, bringing the total active infections in the territory to 80. Restrictions will be lifted today. All communities apart from Arviat, which will remain shut down for at least two more weeks. For the time being, the public health restrictions in the community remain the same as the past two weeks in order to stop community transmission. Masks are mandatory in all public spaces. Outdoor gatherings should not be more than five people. There should not be any visiting in other people's homes or cabins. And travel out of Aviat is still restricted. He adds the lockdown is the quickest way to eventually reduce restrictions. Well, it's time for us to take a commercial break, but still ahead, 
A former Mountie who moderated a private Facebook group for police to spew racist comments was the head of a unit watching land and water protectors and had some choice words about them. Criminal threats to the Canadian petroleum industry. Criminal threats. I mean, we're criminals now because we're defending our land. Welcome back. One week from today, the City of Montreal will adopt its budget for 2021, with it a $15 million raise for police, but cuts to social housing. And as frontliners see it, big headaches for the homeless Indigenous population. Lindsay Richardson explains. RCMP's lead criminal intelligence analyst was Timothy O'Neill and the administrator of a private Facebook group called RCMP Mates with over 12,000 members of current and retired Mounties talking about Indigenous people. Here are some of the comments posted by the members. They are out there procreating faster than smart people. Terrorists should be shot. This goes way beyond reasonable protest. It's so funny. They still call them protesters. They are domestic terrorists. These comments are not attributed to O'Neill, but O'Neill resigned from the group after APTN reported the story of this Facebook group last summer, not before warning other members to delete their comments. I want to alert the group that I was contacted by APTN. Remove any posts that were even the least bit controversial. He also had a message for his followers in the Facebook group. Threatening to go to the media will end with your immediate removal. Jeffrey Monahan, a criminology professor at Carleton University, says a high-ranking officer like O'Neill's involvement with RCMP mates solidifies systemic racism in the RCMP. Uh, it really demonstrates how rotten the institution is that it can't recognize how problematic these things are. APTN reached out to O'Neill several times for an interview. He declined, stating, As a former RCMP employee, I am by law not permitted to discuss my work while employed with the RCMP. But that statement to APTN just a few days ago seems to be a contradiction by what O'Neill posted on RCMP mates and his LinkedIn profile page. Between 2008 and 2014, I was the RCMP's lead criminal intelligence analyst tasked with identifying and analyzing potential and credible threats to the Canadian energy sector. The RCMP confirmed in an email to APTN O'Neill worked on the critical infrastructure team from 2008 to 2012. O'Neill collaborated with other policing agencies such as CSIS, Canada's spy agency, monitoring Indigenous protesters, and completed a criminal intelligence assessment report about the 2013 anti-fracting protests in New Brunswick, which he posted a link to in RCMP Mates and his LinkedIn profile. This is some of the wording in the report. Criminal intentions of the eco-extremists violent Aboriginal extremists, violent rhetoric. Lorraine Clare of Elsa Booktook First Nation is a land and water protector who was on the ground when the RCMP moved in. Criminal threats to the Canadian petroleum industry. Criminal threats. I mean, we're criminals now because we're defending our land. We're protecting our water. We're, you know, defending our, you know, children's and grandchildren's inherit right. Really? <laughs> yeah. Monaghan says reports like O'Neill's only promote one side of the issue, and it's not the Indigenous side. I think there's just so much on-the-ground racism, outright racism, where uh, the RCMP officers are treating Indigenous people like crap. In 2013, Elsa Buttuk First Nation community members and supporters blocked a highway to protest shell gas fracking. The peaceful protest came to a violent end when heavily armed police raided the blockade. Claire was arrested along with 40 other people. This guy is smearing pretty well every 
Aboriginal um, movement that has occurred to defend land, water, and and um, uh, what do you call it? Treaty rights. You know, like that's the other thing. Like they're not <laughs> even stating anything that this is why we're doing it. You know, we're we're defending our rights. You know, if if the tables were turned, if we were infringing on their right, you know, would they not stand up too? Monaghan says O'Neill criminalized indigenous protectors as eco-terrorists. And for policing indigenous protests in particular, it was really kind of sensationalizing the threat um, in a way that I think was trying to, to really kind of put indigenous protests on to the kind of like a higher level of threat to get more resources within the policing bureaucracy. Monaghan isn't the only one raising concerns about the RCMP. A recent report by former Supreme Court Justice Mikhail Bastarash found the culture at the RCMP to be toxic and tolerates misogyny, homophobia and racism. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Tabuktuk, Halifax. Great work there, Angel. Okay, back to that Montreal story that I had mentioned earlier. This city has uh, budgeted a $15 million raise for police, but cuts to social housing. Here's Lindsay Richardson with an explanation of what that means. As Montrealers prepare to stay home for the holidays, residents of this tent city downtown don't have homes to go to. The camp was already dismantled once by force. There's worry now police will come back, especially since the city is putting more boots on the ground. Mayor Valerie Plant promised the upcoming budget would represent all Montrealers. J'ai envie de montrer aux Montréalais et Montréalaises à quel point euh, leur quotidien est important, puis on veut les aider là-dedans. Yet, despite months of heavy protesting and a survey showing majority support for defunding the police, Montreal increased its police budget by $15 million. A total of $660 million will go to the SPVM next year. Plant insists people are happy. But frontliners say this sends another message, putting an end to the genocide of Indigenous women, not now. The Defund the Police Coalition, made up of 75 community groups, says it's a life or death matter. So they proposed an alternative budget, dubbed the People's Vision. It cuts police resources by half. I know for a fact that we can do all this work without police. Like, I'm very confident in that because I'm already doing it. Jessica Keanu heads the Isque project, working directly with Indigenous women. Considering the pandemic, the current overdose and housing crises, she calls for compassion. It's not just to take away from police, it's to replace it with something better, more efficient, and not, uh, not, so tra not tragic, where it ends in a death. She was in January. She was in January. She was in January. Intervention workers know the risks this time of year. COVID-19 complicated things, forcing most shelter clients outdoors. Inuit clients near the open door in Milton Park say their tents and belongings are being confiscated by police. Across the city, women's shelter Shea Doris has lost seven clients since summer, and women on the street are still being ticketed. I think the pandemic has uh, really shown uh, the problems that are evident. Indigenous women are still subjected to police street checks 11 times more often than anyone else. Marina Bulos Winton says the increase for police isn't the problem, it's lack of resources on the ground. The Indigenous population is affected more by homelessness than any other um, demographic group. Um, but they're also affected a lot by addictions. Uh, and trauma, and so they really need culturally appropriate services um, to resolve those problems. But Plant says, bad timing. It would be irresponsible to take, uh, you know, to right away, just cut into budget without having any ideas on how to reallocate that money, for example, in the, in the proper, efficient, pragmatic, Way. Meanwhile, Defund the Police is pushing Montreal for revision and pushing citizens to write city council before the numbers are locked in next week. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Montreal. 
Well, it's time for us to tell you to go to our social media. We want to hear what you think about the RCMP's labeling of Indigenous land and water activists as violent criminal terrorists. Share with us your thoughts. You can send your emails to news at aptn.ca, leave a comment on aptnnews.ca, and you can also, of course, find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, and now TikTok. Well, it's time for another break, but when we come back, a new support system for people of colour in Alberta. We do it by increasing professional opportunities for them, uh, by, by providing empowering and educational resources, events, and professional development. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. This sunny sun dog was captured in Gillum, Manitoba by Delaney Allen with a lovely shot there. We love seeing all of your great pictures outside. Please send them to us to share at aptn.ca. Your photo could be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Five in rain in St. John's, four in sunshine for Fredericton. The Grand River, snow at minus four. Kujarak, minus six in snow. Set Hills, snow and two degrees. One in sunshine for Saguenay. North Bay, zero in snow. Sault Ste. Marie, one in snow. Capus Casing, minus three in snow. Minus four in snow for Timmins. Minus one in sunshine for the Paw. Minus seven in sunny for Puckettawagan. Ones for Gimli and Winnipeg. Three for Brandon, sunshine there. Zeros for North Battleford and Saskatoon. Sunny skies, three in York, did in sunshine. Still sunny up in northern Saskatchewan, minus fives for Uranium City and Stony Rapids. Lots of sun up in northern Alberta, seven for Fort McMurray, four for Grand Prairie. Seven for Edmonton, 13 in sunshine for Calgary and Lethbridge. Kamloops, mixed sun and cloud in two degrees, uh, some cloud and two for Quinell. One in sunny for Fort Nelson, one in snow for Prince George. Whitehorse, 7 in sunny, uh, Dawson City, 5 in snow. 5 in sunshine for Norman Wells. Watee is 3 in sunny. Politech, 4 degrees in cloud. Saks Harbor, minus 5 in snow. Baker Lake, mix the sun and cloud in 12 degrees. New Yacht, minus 9 in snow. Key Night, minus 7 in sunny, minus 17 in sunny for Arctic Bay. Clyde River, minus 18, mix the sun and cloud. There's a new support system for artists who are black, indigenous, or people of color that has started up in Alberta and the West. Chris Stewart spoke to the founder of Creatives Empowered and actress Georgina Lightning on how it can help. Where storytelling is taking place. Creatives Empowered was founded by Shivani Sani to help empower BIPOC artists, which stands for black, indigenous, people of color. Shivani works in the arts and has seen firsthand how non-white people have been given less opportunities just for not being white. So she launched Creators Empowered to offer help for people in Western Canada and particularly Alberta who are underrepresented in the arts scene. We do it by increasing professional opportunities for them, uh, by, by providing empowering and educational resources, events, and professional development, and also by networking, collaborating, and sharing with like-minded uh, individuals and organizations. Hi. Remember me? Detective Culture Do you know where Margaret Red Hawk is? Actress and director Georgina Lightning is a founding member. She says she could have used support like this when she began her career. It's something that I never had. I've been in the industry for 30 years now. And I was by myself, you know, when I joined. There was no kind of role models. There was nobody that I had access to that could support me. You know, I, had, I actually had the opposite. I had people uh, not believing in in the industry that, you know, why are you getting in the film industry? Creatives Empowered is new and building its membership base. Membership is free for Alberta, BIPOC artists and organizations. Lightning says the talent is certainly here. I think once we build membership and realize, you know, who all wants, who all gets this picture and who wants to be involved, I bet you there's enough people there to build a crew or two or maybe six. Maybe we can keep building it. 
Shivani Sani says that one of her goals is to open the minds of those who hire artists. We really need to dismantle the negative stereotypes of racialized professionals. And, you know, the stereotypes are often things like, you know, the talent doesn't exist or we don't know where to find it or that they're not qualified enough or that diversity somehow equals lower quality or poor results, or that you know being inclusive and bringing in diversity is gonna somehow hurt the quality of a production. And the reality is that these stereotypes simply aren't true. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. As part of APTN's two-week deep dive into the child welfare system, In Focus today talked with a social worker who describes a system in chaos, too eager to apprehend Indigenous kids, and Okukum on a hunger strike demanding First Nations implement old ways of dealing with child welfare issues, taking away power from the agencies currently involved with that system. Take a look. Well, from my experience, I've been brought to HR for speaking out or doing something that wasn't uh, uh, policy driven and um, I think I think really at the end of the day they really need to, to see what it is that needs to be done within the communities not come with this policy that's drawn up in, in some city far away mm -hmm. but but and ass assess the, the the communities look to the leaders in the communities and see what it is that needs to be done in order to make things better for these families. Because obviously it's not being done. It's too complex. And you're sending in social workers, frontline social workers that have no clue about the communities or families. Yeah. So that that's the biggest thing. The education piece is huge. Not in not just within the communities, but at every level, government, every every level. You know, through our own our own uh, natural law beliefs, cultural beliefs and values, uh, which includes everyone in the community, including, um, you know, the, the relatives, the friends, the, commu the community membership that aren't related necessarily to the, to the child, they would step up to the plate and, um, and uh, take care of that child if that child was at risk. This, to me, is um, workable, it's doable, and it's been passed down, and uh, we got to get back to that. We also talked to Fiona Moore, a Winnipeg TikTok influencer who's using her massive platform to take aim at the predatory child welfare system. And you can find Fiona Moore on TikTok. Check her out. If you missed any of that in focus this afternoon, you can, of course, find it on APTN News Facebook page. It's all there. And tomorrow, Nation to Nation tackles child welfare after APTN National News. Be sure to watch that. And then on Friday, APTN investigates ways in with a powerful investigative piece. That's also right after the news. Next week, we have even more stories about this broken system. That's all the time we have for tonight. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Have a great one.